When was the last time you stopped and asked someone for directions? Back before we had phones with Google Maps on them, Garmin GPSs that would tell us where to go, back before this thing called MapQuest where you could type in your address in the internet, you had to use a map or an atlas to find out where you had to go. And back in those days, those archaic days when dinosaurs roamed the earth in 1995, sometimes you would use a map to get you kind of to where you wanted to go, but you had to stop and ask for directions, right? Go to a gas station or somewhere. Or maybe you were in the middle of the city and you had your map that told you what highway you needed to get to to go home, but you needed help getting to the highway, so you'd have to ask for directions. Our world is lost and in need of directions. It's in need of a map. We can't really seem to identify right or wrong anymore, male or female, good or bad, or good or evil. Our world seems to have trouble defining those things and navigating them. And at times it feels like our, worst, our world is getting more and more lost. At least as I get older, it feels like the world is getting more and more lost. Or maybe I'm just becoming a little more sensitive to it or in, in touch with what's going on. And I share this because the book of John, it's kind of like one big map telling us where we are now as sinners. It identifies us and shows us on the map who Jesus is and tells us how we can get to where he came from and where he is going to be going. The context for this passage that Marion read for us, Jesus is still in Jerusalem. He's still at the temple. The Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths has just ended that eight-day celebration. It's about six months before his crucifixion, before he will die on the cross for us. And we're in this chapter, chapter 8, where Jesus has just been there and rode in the dust when the religious leaders brought that woman caught in adultery. Right after that, Jesus speaks to these Pharisees, the passage calls them. And in the Gospel of John, there are different types of what's called genre. If that's a, a word maybe you're familiar with from an English class or anything in the past, past, genre describes different types of literature. And in the Gospel of John, there primarily are narrative passages, like a parable or a story, or a miracle that Jesus does, those are usually narrative, kind of we learn from Jesus indirectly from his actions. But in the Gospel of John, he also describes a lot of what's called discourses, meaning Jesus's conversations and talking with people, where we don't learn from Jesus indirectly like actions, but we learn from Jesus directly from what he says and what he teaches. And in the Gospel of John, there are three different types of discourses. There are dialogue-based discourses, where it's kind of like a conversation. Jesus will speak four or five verses. The Pharisees ask a question. Jesus speaks four or five verses. Those are dialogue-based discourses. Then there are brief, direct discourses, sometimes between like two or six words, uh, verses that Jesus will say, pretty straightforward and direct and short. And then there are longer oration discourses. Those are like the Sermon on the Mount, you know, three chapters of well-polished teaching. Or John chapter 15, where Jesus says, I am the vine, I'm the true vine. But what we have here today that we're looking at in chapter 8 are those dialogue-based discourses, which are probably the minority in the Gospels. They're longer, they usually inter inter involve interaction between a group and Jesus, and they're also sometimes harder to follow because there's sometimes this kind of one topic that Jesus is focusing on, but because it's a conversation, he sometimes kind of jumps around based on the questions they ask and sometimes how he doesn't even answer the questions they ask. And that's what we see here today in verses 12 through 30 in chapter 8 of John, is this dialogue discourse that Jesus is having with the Pharisees here at the temple in Jerusalem. And if you have the sermon outlined there, you'll see that first verse talks about Jesus as the light. That's kind of that first talk that Jesus gives. 
Then he talks to them about the law. That's the second discourse. And then he talks to them about life for the final 10 verses. So we'll go through that today together. And Jesus starts out by saying in verse 12, says, Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, John, he liked the number seven. In this book, there are seven miracles that John describes. There are seven disciples that he names. We know there's 12 disciples, but he only gives us the name of seven of them. There are seven long discourses, and this is one of those discourses. And there are seven I am statements in the book. And this is the second I am statement that John gives us about Jesus, where Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And earlier in this chapter, in verse 2, we learn that Jesus goes to the temple early in the morning. So if we can imagine ourselves, we're at the temple with Jesus. We sit down to listen to him teaching there. And maybe we're facing somewhat towards the east, and we can see Jesus talking. And he says, I am the light of the world, to which we kind of see that sun maybe to one side or the other, glaring through into the temple. And the sun, see, it's the center of the universe. It's the source of life, and it's the source of light. When Jesus says he's the light of the world, he's placing himself in the role of the sun that these people would have understood. That Jesus, he's the center of the universe, that he's the source of light, and that he is the source of life to them. He's not just a light, he is the light. And this is something that people probably would have connected to God. In Malachi 4, 2, it says, But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go forth and skip about. John writes in his letter, 1 John 1, 5, he says, This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. See, light bears witness to itself, and it tells you that it's there. And here is Jesus, the one God in the flesh, right in front of them, saying, I am light. And he tells these followers, these people learning from him, that he is the light of the world. And in Matthew, we learn that Jesus calls his followers also. He calls them the light of the world as well. But see, that light is reflected off of him. When it says, he who follows me, there in verse 12, John records Jesus' words using the present active participle, meaning that it's something that we continually, actively participate in, that we are his followers. So Jesus is light that illuminates the dark world, and his followers, we should be reflections of that light. There's much good that's come out of the light of Christians. A lot of our modern hospitals were started by Christian doctors and nurses or Christian philanthropists that funded them and started those hospitals. There are food banks, there are pregnancy resource centers, adoption agencies that are all based on Christians wanting to love others and show that light to others. We even have a missionary that we support, Janet Nickel, that works in another country trying to prevent human trafficking, another way that we show light to others. When we have folks that are in the hospital and are in a nursing home, we try to go to them to love them and encourage them. But when we do that, it's also light that shines to the other people that see us coming. This week, as I was working on this message, I thought about Marcy and her time at Columbia Crest and all the people that have told me they had gone to visit her how Dave and Connie would go see her regularly, Judy would go see her, Wendy and Adam had gone there and sung, as she shared, Ruth Ann used to go there, and Shirley and Stephanie used to go there. And I'm sure there's others that that used to go visit her that I didn't name because I forgot or didn't know. And I hope, as I was thinking about this last night, going through this list, I hope she was the most popular person at that place. Because I know I would go regularly, and I didn't really see other people getting a visitor. But I hope we were there showing 
love to her and being a light to the other residents and the nurses and workers that when you're part of a believing family, part of a church, that this is what we do for each other. And through that, we've even developed relationships with a few of the other folks she lived with and are in contact now. So Jesus is that light, and we reflect that light to others through our actions. When you see the moon at night, Sometimes we can see all of it, sometimes we can't see some of it, but there are some of those nights where you can see half the moon, right? Where it's dark where we're at, you look up and you see the moon, and one half is illuminated from the sun coming from this side. And when I was in astrology class in college, we had an astrology professor at this tiny little school I was attending from Oxford University. It was interesting. All the way from London, this guy that would teach astrology. And I remember us asking him about how the light works. Because sometimes you can see the light on the sun. Or I'm sorry, you can see the light from the sun on the moon. But sometimes, even though the other half of the moon is dark, you can still kind of see the silhouette. Have you ever noticed that? The sun's not directly on it. And I remember in that class, us asking him, how is it you can see the dark side of the moon? And he said, this is what happens. The light shines from the sun, it hits the moon, and then it reflects that light to earth, which is why we can see that half. But then some of that light also reflects back from the earth, back up to that dark side of the moon. And that's why you can sometimes see that little silhouette of the dark side of the moon. And for some of us, we are pretty strong in our walk with Jesus. We've got a strong faith. We know the Bible. We can put out a lot of light, like that half of the moon that gets direct sunlight. But some of us, maybe we're busier. We have four kids and two jobs, and we, we just have a little light that we can give to others. But that's okay. What's important is that we're reflecting that light in the world. No matter how much of it we can or can't reflect, we're supposed to do that. So Jesus talks about light, but the Pharisees, they start talking about law. They kind of change the subject right away. They can't see the grace and the truth that's standing right in front of them. They can only see the law which they know. N.T. Wright, which is an English, uh, he's an Anglican priest from London, he says, this chapter highlights the problem which runs through the whole chapter. Israel was supposed to be the light of the world, but Israel was providing only darkness. If Jesus was now shining the true light into that darkness, there could only be one result, a head-on clash. And that's what we find here with the Pharisees. And they bring up the law, starting in verse 13. So the Pharisees said to him, responding to him as he says he's the light, you are testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, Even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true, for I know where I came from and where I'm going. But you do not know where I come from or where I'm going. You judge according to the flesh. I am not judging anyone. But if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone in it. But I and the Father sent me. Even in your law, it has been written that the testimony of two men is true. I am who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. So they were saying to him, where is your father? Jesus answered, you know, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. So the Pharisees try to take this conversation back to the law, but Jesus changes the conversation to talking about his origin, where he came from, and his destination, where he is going to return to. And he tells them in verse 14, I know where I came from and where I'm going, which we know as we've been reading all along, Jesus came from heaven, where he existed forever in heaven with God and came to earth. Jesus knows both his origin and his destination, but the Pharisees seem to know neither of those. And as Jesus is the one giving us directions about where he came from and where he's going, he has the ultimate authority to tell us where to get to, how to get to where he's going. Why? First, because he's been there. 
See, Jesus is not a travel agent. He's a tour guide. Do we remember travel agents? Talking about maps and travel agents. I got all old illustrations. But a travel agent back in the days when dinosaurs were on the earth in the 1990s, you would show up to a travel agent's office. That person would show you a brochure of somewhere to go. You'd say, I want to go there. And he or she would book you the trip and send you off. That's the job of a travel agent. But a tour guide is different. See, a tour guide has been everywhere you're about to go. They walk with you through it, and they describe how to get to where you want to go. And that's Jesus. He's been to heaven. He's come to earth. Now he's telling them, this is the map of how to get back to where I'm going. So Jesus has authority to tell them how to get to heaven. One, because he's been there. Also, because the Father verifies it for us, for him. In verse 16, it says, Beating if I judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone in it, but I and the Father who sent me. Verse 18, I am he who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. But the Pharisees, they don't seem to understand. They seem to think Jesus is talking about his earthly father. So they ask him, where is your father? In verse 19. And this is sad because they might know God's word, which is the law, but they don't seem to know God's son, which is right in front of them. So Jesus, after he's described for them his origin and his destination, now he's going to talk to the Pharisees about their origin and their future destination. In verse 19, he says, You neither know me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father. Their question showed their ignorance because Jesus is the revelation of the Father. These are all the things he's been telling them. He tells them in verse 23, you are from below. You are of this world. And we know from John, 1 John chapter 5, 19, he writes, we know that we are of God, meaning us believers, but the world lies in the power of the evil one. These Pharisees are under the dominion of the devil and under his authority on earth since they reject Jesus. They have their origin in the darkness of the world that they live in, and when they die, they live in their sins, so they're going to spend eternity in hell. And the only light they'll see there are from the flames that will be burning there. And notice a little subtle note that John inserts for us in verse 20. In verse 20, 27, and 30, John gives us a couple little explanations to help us not miss what the points of the story are. In verse 20, John inserts this note. He says, these words Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. So Jesus is speaking in the treasury, which was located in what was called the court of the women, where men and women could go. It was probably the most public place of the temple, where the most people could go. And in that court of the women, there was the treasury, which had 13 chest boxes that looked like trumpets, where people would come in and offer their money. And there'd be little inscriptions on each box that said what the money went for. And John puts this in here as, I think, a little subtle note to tell us. Here these Pharisees are, talking to Jesus about the law, in the most public place in the temple, where you could keep track of the most legalistic thing, how much people gave and what they were giving to. And the message John's trying to tell us here is that legalism and rules are not what saves you, like the Pharisees seem to think, but instead it's based on a relationship with the person. That's what saves you. It's not what you know about the law. It's about who you know. And just because you're religious doesn't mean that you are a believer. You know, following the rules of religion like these Pharisees did does not mean that they believed in Jesus as their Savior. And I say that because I know some people have been deeply hurt by folks that were more interested in following a set of rules than they were in helping people develop and cultivate a relationship with Jesus. 
And we, if it hasn't been us, I know we know other people that have been hurt in that way. See, Christianity is not about rules. It's about a relationship. It's not what we know about the law or the Bible. It's who we know and have a relationship with and who we believe in. Jesus doesn't give us a bullet point list of things to do in order to get saved. He gives us an invitation to spend time with him and get to know him for salvation. So this transition occurs between Jesus talking about first the light and then the Pharisees talking about the law to a transition talking about life. And notice two maps with directions Jesus has given them. They can follow the road of sin that leads to death, Jesus describes for them, or they can follow the road of faith that leads to life. Marion's translation said faith, mine says uh, believe, kind of synonyms, faith and belief. And that road that sin, that road of sin that leads to death, are described in verses 21 and 24. Jesus says, I go away and you'll seek me, and you will die in your sins. Verse 21. Then verse 24, he repeats it two more times, talking to the Pharisees, You will die in your sins. Unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. And these Pharisees, they're like any other person that has rejected Jesus. Romans 3.23 tells us, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's why we need to place our faith in Jesus for salvation. We all kind of start out at that same place, sinful from birth, but it's through our faith in Jesus. And these Pharisees, even though they know lots about the law, and they try to do the right things, They've rejected that one that has come to take away their sins. And because they live in that sin, they're going to die in sin. But Jesus also describes this road of faith that leads to life. He gives them these two maps, that road of sin that leads, leads to death, or that road of faith that leads to life. And that road of faith that leads to life is based on Jesus being God. Notice in verse 24 near the end, it says, I am he. And then in verse 28, he repeats it. I am he. You might recognize that those three words connecting back to a guy named Moses that was wandering around in the desert. And God appears to Moses in the desert through a burning bush. And one of the things that God says to Moses I am who I am. Jesus is talking to these Pharisees in language they would understand. They wouldn't have missed the fact he says, I am he, I am he. He's given them a map that they can interpret and they can follow. See, Jesus came to redeem man and to reveal God to man. And this statement combines their past understanding of who God was with the future description of what God will do. See, that road of faith that leads to life, it's based on Jesus being God, but it's also based on Jesus being sacrificed for them. We see a prediction of Jesus' death on the cross. In verse 28, the very beginning, it says, When you lift up the Son of Man, you will know that I am He. This prediction, future prediction of Jesus being lifted up on a cross and dying for on their behalf. So that road of faith that leads to life, it's based on Jesus being God. It's based on Jesus being sacrificed for our sins. But it's also based on who we place our faith in. John's emphasis on faith in Christ and salvation is seen in this passage as well as throughout our entire book. He told them in verse 24, you will die in your sins unless you believe that I am he. And then at the very end, verse 30, John gives another one of those explanations, kind of helping us make sense of what's going on. He says, many came to believe in Jesus. That's the road of faith that leads to life. It's based on Jesus being God. It's based on Jesus being sacrificed, and it's based on our faith in him. 
And notice in verse 29, that road of faith that leads to life, it will not always be easy. There'll be heartaches and troubles. Some of us are even going to be, you know, bearing light for Jesus and bad things are going to happen. Loved ones might pass away unexpectedly. We might lose our jobs and have financial troubles. But in verse 29, Jesus says, he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. Right after he talks about how he'll be crucified for them. Just as God the Father was with Jesus and didn't leave him, he won't leave us either as we're trying to walk that road of faith that leads to life. So as we wrap up our time together, I'm glad that Jesus gives us a map. I'm glad it's clear and definitive because our world is lost without Jesus. It's our dark place. But through the light of Jesus, we know how to get to heaven. He makes it crystal clear for us. And he says that we participate in that light, that we're supposed to be that light that illuminates the dark world that we live in, wherever that might be our work or our family, our community that we meet with. We're supposed to be that light. And we know that God will not leave us just as he didn't leave Jesus as we try to be that light. Jesus is the light of the world, and he gives us directions so that we can follow him to heaven. Let's pray. God, thank you for a safe place we can come to read these things that we know isn't always accepted in our culture or sometimes isn't always politically correct, but it's your word and we are committed to following it. Thank you for a church that loves other people and makes an effort to, to show that love to people, even when it's inconvenient, when it takes time, money, or even emotional stress to do that work, to serve and love others. So thank you for a church that knows what, what it's really about to follow you, to love others and be light in a dark world. And it's not always easy, but I pray that you would give us strength and help us as we go about our weeks and our days to show light to others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, so at this point, we have uh, Kendra is going to say a few words. Instead of reading a benediction, we're going to have a special Father's Day dismissal. So Kendra and Wendy, I think, have a few things they're going to do from here.